something from her. So anyway, all right. So today we're going to do the applications of St. Thomas's view. And um, so I'll just, does everybody understand how last time we had this view of God where there is the God of reason, who is the foundation of the natural world, who created a world that we can understand. We can understand our place in it. We can understand how we're supposed to treat the natural world. We can use it for our purposes, but not for our excesses. We know when we're using it for excess. We also can understand our own psyches and we can understand our behaviors and their implications for other people. So evolution makes it possible for us to develop medicine, to take care of ourselves. So this is the God that wants us to do all this stuff, right? God gave us reason. God gave us a universe we can understand. God wants us to use our reason as much as possible for human well-being. Then there is the God of faith. And that's the God um, of, you know, transcend, supernatural. And that's the God who you look at yourself as a creature of free will. And your goal is eternal salvation. So on the view of reason, for example, when you create a legal system, you have to have appropriate punishments that fit the crime, all those rules. But for the supernatural, for salvation, you forgive people seven times, 70 times, right? So your heart has agape, right? The love of God and love of neighbor goes way beyond and outside of what a legal system would want. So when, St. Thomas put those two together. It was very powerful because in theory, you could have incredible human beings, right? Mm -hmm. They set up a very rational society and they go above and beyond to love God, forgive. Uh, when someone uh, slap, takes your coat, give them your cloak. You just are generous beyond reproach. You're not greedy, right? So if you put those two together, you should have human flourishing to the max. Right. Um, but anyway, it was a powerful force in the culture for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and that isn't simply because of the authoritarianism in it. It was compelling. Also, it did still have this, the priests are the mediators between the public and God. And so they interpreted the, the truth, right, to the public. Um, and that's where Protestantism came in. Martin Luther said, here I stand. I have to act on my own conscience. Then, then Martin Luther said, got to the point, people are getting too rebellious. You had to choose between Lutheran and Catholic. Mm -hmm. Well, then there's all this Protestant, you know, everybody breaks off. Apparently there's 84 different kinds of Baptists in Arkansas. Yeah. So, so it just completely ex exploded. So I like to defend the Catholic tradition because I like some kind of systematic way of understanding, right? Mm -hmm. So that not anybody can say, oh, God inspired me to say this or that. Or, I mean, it can go anywhere at this point. Mm -hmm. You can find a Bible quote, you know? So, um, so I like this tradition. I live with Catholic nuns. I spent nine of my summers spending at least a month up with the Sisters of St. Benedict. And they like my work, even if it is not Catholic per se, and it's not even Christian. It's pretty pagan, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But they like it. They like Jungian psychology. They like, uh, they like everything I do. I'm, I'm really, I love those sisters. But anyway. Um, so let's look at this and look at all of his policies, because some of them you would call super conservative and some of them are very liberal. And so again, St. Thomas, the traditional Catholic orthodoxy cannot be labeled either 
conservative or liberal. Right. It is what it is. And it's usually it's just a different emphasis that drives it one way or the other, but it should not be used to polarize. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the Catholic Church. Um, Benedict was a very polarizing right wing guy and Francis is a liberal and there's a lot of Catholics against him. So, you know, take it or leave it. But here we go. Let's go with birth control. This would be a conservative position. So let me just, um, okay. So here's the mindset that there's, oh, there's two goals in life. Let me go back to what I didn't get to last time in the, um, I think it was, yeah, here, here, this is it. There's two goals in life, right? There's two senses of truth, the revealed truth through the scripture and also through prayer, and then the learned truth through reason. There's two goals of life, salvation and wisdom based on knowledge. There's um, two ways to approach questions about the existence of God. There's the proofs number one through four were based on reason. And then the fifth one was based on faith, that God has, uh, has an interest in every single individual. Whereas in Aristotle, you, you become fully human mem member of your species. You have your own friends and your own existential context, but the model to follow is always this natural model of flourishing. Whereas the Christian view is in addition, there's a personal God who has a personal agenda for you. And there's this God who has an agenda for the sons of Abraham, right? That makes it really personal. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the knowledge of God. How do we know God? Well, through reason. But the other one is one of the Beatitudes um, uh, is that if you're pure in heart, you can see God. So it's an intuition, right? Uh, based on purity of heart. And that's where um, I do think that some people, because of their character, Aristotle would say it's because you have a strong character, you desire the good. But you know, the Christian is, um, it's just that people do claim to have that insight, that intuition. And I understand it because some really mature people, they always come up with better ideas than other people about how to react to certain situations. Um, so I can understand it. It's just that it, it's open to corruption, right? Because any preacher can decide that he sees, you know, the will of God and it and sort of it can easily corrupt your heart. So you do have to really have purity of heart. And that Jesus was really insistent about that. I saw uh, that last semester when I was studying the Reformation period. There was a lot of that um, I don't know, prophesizing. A lot of people were claiming to be prophets reborn or to be a prophet of the lord and it caused a lot of confusion for people that's still true yeah yeah some, some woman in arizona was interviewed and she said well we believe that god works through evil people and so we believe that trump is god's plan for america and i'm sure there's a lot of people who believe that right so yeah, I, mean, mm, I don't think God works through evil. I well, think that he doesn't let evil things stop him. You know, it's just like human resilience and persistence. You know, we find a way to make things work. Well, I mean, who does the devil work through? <laughs> right? right. I, there's that problem. <laughs> well, well, then the other one is, I can understand evil people that repent and they change, right? But not evil people who love their evil, right? 
I mean, that not that the devil? Like, what the heck is this? I was like, I don't get it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't talk like that, but I, it just doesn't make any sense. And our founders would be very worried when people behave politically in ways that make absolutely no sense. Right. And that completely split faith from reason. And the faith-based actions absolutely undermine the reason-based judgments. Our founders would be really worried about that. Because um, when you're deciding who to vote for, stick to the facts. That's what right. the founders said, yeah. Anyway, so there's two uh, human, God's emotions. God has intellectual pleasures, the beauty of the order of the universe. But do you remember also God has a will because God chose to create. And then the natural object of the will is to love. For us, the object of the will, love God, love your neighbor. So what motivated God was love. So God is love. I think that, I just think it's cool. It all fits together. Mm -hmm. um, and so God knows both the universal the biosphere, the system, and God also knows the particular. Um, whereas, according to reason, God just know uh, God just knows, or what's available is just the system itself and how it all fits together. The origin of the universe on the matter of faith, it was created from nothing. On Aristotle's view. It just was a change from potentially material to actually material, right? It didn't really, they don't really explain it and they don't have a personal God. And especially one that's got a plan for the sons of Abraham, <laughs> that wouldn't go over too well. What is human happiness? Well, according to faith, it's the supernatural principles, the articles of faith, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, love God and love your neighbor, hope for salvation, right? And the reason-based happiness is understanding the universe, acting according to the, it's just strength of character, right? Doing what's best. Then there's divine reason. It's called natural law. And this is what the Catholic church, what the Pope uses all the time is natural law which is the description of the order of the universe that God created, human beings make temporal laws. The temporal laws need to be based on eternal law or natural law. So a lot of the things we cover today are how do you make temporal laws are accountable to natural law. And then there's in the divine law, there's the old law of the Old Testament and the new law. Jesus replaced the old law. Um, all right, so then I had all of that. But now let's go to the ethics, what we do today. And um, okay, so now we have birth control. So we have the natural law and the supernatural law. So raise your hand if you're lost at some point because it's very systematic. Okay, so responsible parenthood implies a profound relation to the objective moral order established by God, of which a right conscience is the faithful interpreter. So there is an order. I just described it, right? You mold your conscience to fit that order. And so you always ask, does this conform to the natural law? And does it conform to the supernatural law, right? So you have duties. Your duties toward God are um, you believe that you have to do what you need to do to get saved, right? And in order to be saved, you cannot commit a sin, no disordered acts. And then according to the natural law, you should always act according follow the natural order. Well, what is the final cause? You remember I talked about final causes. What is the final cause, the purpose of uh, sexual intercourse? 
the purpose of it is procreation, right? That's the natural order. So natural law dictates that every act of intercourse be open to procreation. So God created a world where not every act of intercourse leads to pregnancy, but the natural law insists that it's open to the possibility of pregnancy, okay? And um, so, and our free will, we should never choose sin, right? No disordered acts in order to be saved. Lust is, is a sin, greed, pride, right? So um, love is of the senses and the spirit. It's not an expression of mere instinct, right? And sentiment. In human beings, we never separate sexual behavior from spiritual life. Um, when we try to, like rape, it's a huge offense, right? It's a huge sin, but it messes with your mind, right? It's traumatizing because it's so unnatural. And people remember it. It's not like it's a one-off. It injures people. It injures their character. It affects them for life. So we are not mere characters of instinct. We can't act like other animals do when they go into heat and then they have sex and then they, you know, we aren't like that. Our sexual behavior is tied to a whole history and a set of relationships. And if we try to act like mere, I don't know, you don't like to accuse animals I mean, if we try to rip our sexuality from our, our being as cultural creatures, we do great damage to ourselves and others. So an act of free will can, because it's free will, remember Augustine, we can turn it toward the temporal alone, or we can turn it toward the union of the temporal and the spiritual. So every conjugal act, according to natural law, has to be open to the transmission of life because that's the natural purpose. And the supernatural law, every conjugal act has to be agreed upon, right? Consensual and unitive. It has to be an act of love. So even within a marriage, there's no forced sex and there's no, you know, disinterested, it, every act of sex needs to be an act of love as well as open to procreation. The goal of marriage is um, the supernatural goal is the spiritual unity of the partners. The natural goal is to have a family. The natural place of a woman is to be the helpmate of a man, although that has become more liberal. Women are also have a place in the broader society. And the Pope says women should have careers and all that, um, but they but they're primary. But they should be the primary caregiver at home. Um, all conjugal acts include the unitive meaning. Um, reason and will have to dominate instinct and passion. That partners have to be faithful and and exclusive until death. All right. Children, how do you teach your children? Well, you habituate them to love virtue, that's the Aristotelian, but you also teach them faith, hope, and charity. And you can't commit disordered acts and say that they're for the good of the family, right? Because they're disordered acts. Um, society, the temporal laws should reflect the natural and eternal law, and the secular world has to be infused with spiritual values that promote chastity, right? So the Catholic Church allows for the rhythm method. If there's serious motives to space out births, it's okay because we know that women ovulate just during certain times of the month. So God created us that way. We can use our reason. We can figure out to abstain during... Uh, during certain times of the month. That's fine. That's completely within 
the natural law and the supernatural law. But using artificial birth control is not. That's using your free will to try to manipulate your body so that you can get away with it, right? So that you can have sex that is not open to procreation. I mean, you might get, you might get pregnant, but you didn't will, right? You willed to have sex without procreation. So it's what you will that's the sin. Um, so for in the mind of the church, those are fundamentally different. And if a student will say, yeah, but in both cases, you want to have sex without, pro well, then you're not doing the rhythm method correctly, you know, then it's a sin. But the rhythm method itself, if you have the right attitude, which you should have, um, I mean, if you had that attitude, I want to have sex without getting pregnant, you might as well use artificial birth control. <laughs> um, it's that I want to stay within the natural order. What are the consequences of using artificial birth control? Well, people will become unfaithful and the level of morality will go down. There'll be more premarital, extramarital. Men will lose respect for the woman, use her as his object of lust. Um, public authorities can, can use, use it. The Chinese have used it. Um, there are natural limits to the degree to which human beings should dominate their own bodies and human reason should limit itself. When reason oversteps it, it's pride and sin. Um, the function of the church is to proclaim the moral law, right? We, the church didn't invent these laws. It only explains them to the people so people know what they have to do to be saved. Well, what about overpopulation? The church says, if you have self-control and you abstain periodically each month, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, the means justify the ends. No, the, the church says it's never right to freely choose to commit a disordered act. Economics, what if you can't afford that many kids? Well, it's not evil to be poor. You can work your way, self-mastery, right? We're asking for self-control. Children in the US are spoiled. They don't work hard enough and they have too much stuff. Um, what about women's psychology? Well, women still can work um, outside of the home, but their first place is to be the caregiver and also promote spiritual values. We don't want kids to be secularized from the day they're born. We want spiritual values and they can be modeled at the home and home. And then if you say, well, we're just in a secular world, well, having faith is a choice. And the church is never going to tell you that, well, you just have to choose the secular life because it's too powerful. A church would never say that, right? Um, science has given us the ability to manipulate nature, but it, you know, it also gives us the ability when we're unhealthy to bring ourselves back to health. That's great. But when it starts manipulating, treating the body like silly buddy for its own self-interest, then the church goes, no. All right. So what do you guys think of that? Um, Alicia, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I personally... I've used birth control and even having used birth control, I am on my ninth pregnancy. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and having said that, I've only given birth to four children. This will be the fifth. So just because a woman gets pregnant, I think nature and God combined have a way of controlling that. You know, not every pregnancy ends in a birth. And part of, part of faith is God won't give you more than you can handle. 
So if I am a poor person and I have 10 children, then that means I should I don't, be willing to go and do what I need to do to get to where we can support ourselves so that other people don't have to support us. I don't, I wouldn't ever say that it is a religious duty, a moral duty or obligation to have children. But I do agree that the point of sex is procreation. It's the continuation of the species. And it is to improve the, the marital bond, that relationship that God intended for man and woman. Okay. And I think that when you take away from that relationship, I mean, he's got it right. It, it falls apart. Sex is no longer something that's almost sacred, you know, or well, for the two people. It's just, oh, uh, I don't know. It's, you know, it's fulfilling an appetite. Right. Like if you're hungry, you eat and you're, right. you're you know what do they say hot or what do they say i can't remember <laughs> when you want sex i can't remember uh <laughs> that's how old i am mean, college i think they i don't even i don't know what they call it anymore either I mean, <laughs> oh my god i can't even remember it's terrible yeah but I anyway mean, um yeah when people are just sort of roaming around i want some sex just like you know i want some food or i want a drink yeah um, Okay, but I'll talk to Warren and then I'll throw in another wrench here for you. Okay, Warren, what do you think? I am on the same side as Alicia, I would say. Um, I think what's happened is, and it's all about the whole free will thing again, God created sex for this purpose, yes. And then we came and we, as human beings, manipulated um, what it was intended to do. And then they're gonna be like, oh, the whole goal of sex is for married people and that you should accept the, basically there's kind of saying, they're trying to make it seem as if it's something okay, but they're basically saying, if you do this, having a child would be the consequence in a sense. And they're blowing, I think they're taking it out of proportion and using the Bible as their defense to say, because in the Bible it says, be fruitful and multiply. Okay. And I think that is a statement, yes, in the Bible, but I think that should be taken in different contexts. It doesn't mean that, oh, the Bible says this, so I only work X amount of money for the week. The Bible says I should be fruitful and multiply. Let me go have 10 children. Like, it has to all be taken into context. And as it relates to birth control, I think it's people taking that same sentence into context to say, okay, I want to do this, but I don't want to have a child while I'm doing it. It's just us taking sex and manipulating and turning it into anything that it's now become a business because we have the adult industry. It's now become something of just pleasure whether it's empty pleasure or whatever. And it's also become something that we'd be like, okay, we're law, we're abiding what God says or what the church says, and we're going to do it only when we're married. So people take their different spin onto it. And I just think that at the end of the day, you just have to use your best judgment. It is up to you. Um, I'm not going to say there's not a wrong or right way to take it because there's a wrong way to take it. Because if you say you just want to have 10 kids because the Bible says um, you should be fruitful and multiply and you're a believer, you're just doing what the Bible says. I personally think that is wrong because you would not be only doing yourself a disservice. You'll be doing your kids a dis uh, disservice because you won't be able to provide for them. And also you'd be doing whatever country or state that you live in another disservice because if you want to look at it as a bigger scale, there's an economic level that, okay, you're not able to do this or whatever, you're gonna affect 
the economy of wherever you live. So I think personally, that would be wrong if you're like, okay, I'm a believer. Let me go do this. So it's all in, it has to be taken into context. Well, also the natural environment, right? Exactly, because I mean, you're just- We're like, destroying the natural environment. Exactly. There's too many people. So, you know, uh, anyway, so here's the other wrench that you've already anticipated that in the modern world, when the Reformation and then modern science and then Protestantism arose, Protestantism got associated with God wants us to exploit the natural world for human well-being. Okay. And that's what Alicia was pointing out that actually the Pope is very much of an environmentalist, which is very consistent with this natural law theory. Does that make sense? Um, but, um, and so it's the Protestant, the belief that using science to exploit nature, but we've gone too far, right? And we know that, right? Bill Gates is, <laughs> you know, how to avoid climate disaster. He knows. Um, but so, so on the one hand, the Catholic view is more environmentalist. And the Protestant view is what led to all this exploitation that had, has now gotten out of hand. But on the other view, the Catholics are against birth control. So these people keep having kids in a world that doesn't need more kids because it's undermining the ecosystem. We have way too many people. And so the Protestant view of birth control is you better use birth control. If you can't afford a kid, you, you better use birth control. Like it's irresponsible, irrational not to use birth control, right? So, I mean, don't people talk about when do you, if you, when you plan to have a kid, it's a virtue to plan to have a kid. What do you plan on the basis of? Can I afford it, right? <laughs> And so it's related to money, but that's a virtue to calculate and only have as many kids as you can afford, right? And then you're not a burden to the government. And then also, if you just have a few kids, you're not gonna create as much pollution, except that of course the average Protestant has more money. And so each kid pollutes more than these big Catholic families, right? <laughs> so it's, really it's a mess but it's not unintelligible and it's people really do think these ways mm -hmm. they fall back sometimes they're not aware that this is a part of a whole worldview that you grew up with that didn't realize you were growing up with it mm -hmm. but okay alicia so my question is do do people really disagree and some people think you you're you're wrong and you're evil even if you don't use birth control and if you have kids you can't afford because God wants you to provide for your kid and the, the society you live in, you should care about the public good. It cannot sustain poor kids mm -hmm. and you, right, you need to take care of them for the society's sake. So what do you think, Alicia? Do you think there's really two sides or what's your reaction to that? Okay, my reaction is as a society, we have gone so far away from where we started that it's really hard to live in a balance, you know, between nature and spirit without circumventing natural law. I mean, back in the day, yeah, 12 year olds were getting married, but they were getting married to people who were already set, you know, they already had a job, they had a house or whatever. Nowadays, it is nothing for two teenagers to move out of their parents house just because neither parent will let them live there together, you know. So do I look at my son and say, well, I mean, just don't have sex because you'll end up getting pregnant. Or do I say, 
if you're going to have sex, do it safely. <laughs> That's what I say, right? If you're going to have sex, do it safely. We have gotten so far past following moral laws that if we don't circumvent natural law as well, then we are endangering our civilization. We're endangering our planet. We're in danger. So yeah, I think that there is not a way to completely satisfy both sides. And you have to there find is. you have to find the balance between. I mean, right. and some people are gonna think that you're not doing it right, but everybody has their own center, their own point of balance. But it does have an impact on the natural environment it, and the culture. Oh yeah, right? it certainly does. Well, here's another way to describe how unnatural things are. It used to be that the kind of job you would get to survive, you knew how to do by the time you were 15. But now you have to get, you know, college, graduate school. And so on the one hand, people are basically fed and clothed, right? They're comfortable. And all these ads that, that provoke sexual um, attraction. And so you tell teenagers, okay, don't have sex until you're 28 and you're established and, you know, and then you can get a job. I mean, that's a pretty heavy lift. Does that make sense to you, Warren and uh, Alicia? Yeah, that's not practical in today's society. It just isn't, like, if I were to say that, I would think to myself, who am I kidding? Yeah, because it's just because of this high tech society and everybody needs all this education and it's expensive. And if you have a kid, you're really going to fall off, you know. So, um, so I, you know, with the college students, I tend to say, I mean, I didn't have premarital sex myself, but it is kind of a lot that parents ask when they say, don't have sex till you're 28. <laughs> and you've done grad school and then you get married and then you can have sex so that's quite a heavy lift um okay warren your turn what do you think about these two sides about using artificial or not personally what i say to each his own that that is what that, that is what i believe to each his own because as alicia said we've gone so far as a society it's very hard to find a middle ground where everyone can agree on it's either your hard left or your hard right and realistically it should not be that way because it's too extreme i would say it's all it? like you're trapping people to say okay this is what you got to do or this is what you got to do how about we do like what um What's the guy's name that we read on last class where he took from Augustine and yeah, it's yeah. Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Take from both sides, put them together. Right. And so the public good. So that's the next outline I'm going to do is that he did have a lot of concern for the public good. And so, you know, there's an argument that you need to limit your family size for the sake of environmental preservation and also social stability. Because when you have an entrenched poor class of people, you have instability. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, but those are things that it seems like you could talk to people about. Here are the arguments for um using artificial birth control or at least really seriously doing the rhythm method right and not just playing it by ear and whatever happens happens <laughs> does that make sense um all right so i i realize we're not getting through that outline but we have time on friday and what we're going to do on friday let me just summarize what we're going to do on friday um because i i think it's nice to talk one of those out because all the rest of them you could have just a lot of talk about 
the just war theory is really interesting and it covers a, makes a lot of distinctions. There are a lot of Protestants that that use this. There's a, there's a Muslim just war theory that's almost identical. Um, then there's Francis on gay issues. Then there's uh, Francis's talk to the UN and to the US political leaders, which I think is really important. And these are his, what he says, and I, I would like us to talk about this. And it all fits into his natural law and supernatural law, but a lot of it is natural law. It's based on reason and that's why he can go to the UN and he can say, you all should do this. This isn't Catholic, this is natural law. Um, and then in addition, Catholics should, you know, be particularly forgiving or whatever. Um, and then this one is a conservative. You should have no in vitro fertilization, no artificial insemination. Every act of intercourse needs to be open to procreation and every procreation has to be the result of intercourse between a married couple. All right, that's the conservative side. And, and I think both of you understand that, right? That would follow the natural law and the um, uh, supernatural law. And the church's job is just to tell you what you have to do to get saved. So here it is, and it fits with reason. But again, it's, you know, people say, but what about my situation? <laughs> and the, you know, the Pope has to go, I can't, you know, I'm just telling you what you have to do. Um, so we'll go over that. That's why the church is identified both with really conservative as well as I'll say really liberal. This one is about the movie Romero and, and Romero goes from being um, conservative to actually being uh, declaring war on his society because it's so unjust. And actually St. Thomas says that you can commit sedition against your government if it's corrupt enough. So that's super liberal, right? And so, but it all makes sense. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. And that's how we get into Martin Luther King letter from a Birmingham jail. And he uses Augustine, Aquinas, Socrates, Aris I don't know if he refers directly to Aristotle, but you know, and then the Bible. So I think it's great. I love this document. And it is, it shows you how the same philosophy can lead either to hyper conservative uh, issues or people's decisions or to pretty much hyper liberal. And even in El Salvador, the, you know, resisting the administration. So this was King was nonviolent resistance demonstrations. In El Salvador, you couldn't have demonstrations, you get killed. So, but uh, Romero ended up supporting every act that would undermine the government because it was so corrupt. But anyway, that's where we're going. And so um, uh, I, that was a great, I knew we'd have a great discussion, but there's so much we could have great discussions for hours. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that all of these things are super interesting. Does that make sense to you, Warren? Yes, it does. Yes, it definitely does. I okay. know we can go on and on for days. <laughs> they're all they're all really important distinctions too. They're meaningful. Okay, take care, and I hope Ivy comes comes back soon. All right. <laughs> I'll okay, I, if you turn on the video, we miss you. <laughs> come on, come on over. Bye-bye. Bye. See you Friday. Okay.